So I'm going to talk today about finches, um, and um, I'm going to begin just by talking about what even is a finch. Some of you may be wondering what's a cardioline finch. Um, let's just start by talking briefly about what is a finch in general. There's a few different um, uh, groups of birds that we qualify as finches. They all have these uh, kind of conical beaks. That's sort of the uh, thing that we use to identify finches in general. But the, um, the, there's the things like this house sparrow is a ploceid finch. They're called weaver finches. Um, there's estrilded finches. These are the families, by the way. Um, like zebra finches, these are called waxbill finches. Um, there's a whole bunch of birds that are in, in this family called the emberizidae um, that are emberizid finches, like this black-headed grosbeak. And uh, then there are what we call the fringillidae, um, like this chaffinch. And um, uh, this is actually the group that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the fringillids have a couple of subfamilies. Um, in them. So just so you know, things that end in this I-D-A-E, those are families of birds. If it ends in I-N-A-E, that's a subfamily, so it's a smaller grouping. Uh, the, the classic fringaline finches are uh, things like the chaffinch and the brambling. These are old world birds. Um, there's little birds called euphonias, a really cool group of tropical American um, finches. Uh, that's another subfamily. And then there's the cardualines. So this is a subfamily, the carduellini. Um, and here's a few birds that are in that group. And if you didn't know, our Hawaiian honeycreeper birds are actually all card carduline finches. They're derived from a colonizing uh, carduline finch to the Hawaiian Islands a number of millions of years ago. So we're going to talk about these um, carduline finches. And there's a bunch of them that you're probably familiar with. Um, evening grosbeaks, rosy finches, red poles, pine grosbeaks, crossbills, gold finches, siskins, uh, uh, cassins and purple finches and house finches. These are all carduline finches. And these are what I'm going to focus on. And I'm mostly going to talk about um, the ones that we'll encounter in the West here. Um, and um, But there will be some examples that I'll pull in from other parts of the world because I've found pictures of them or something. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus in on a few different aspects of their biology. There's a, a zillion cool things that finches do or that uh, attributes that they have. So I just sort of picked a few things that were my favorite things. Um, and um, I'm going to stick with those things. We'll talk about feeding adaptations, annual schedules for breeding and, molt and, and um, movement. We'll talk about some of their vocal behavior, including call learning. Um, and heterospecific vocal imitation. This is where they put the sounds of other species of birds into their songs. And call learning is distinct from song learning. So we'll come back to that. This is a really interesting feature of, of, of some of our finches. And then we'll finish off with a little bit about the cryptic taxa. That is things that are just hard to tell apart and um, um, bird watchers like those. And there's many of you are probably familiar with all of the different 12 vocal types of, of red crossbills, the five vocal types of evening grosbeaks. We'll talk a little bit about those because they're super interesting and we, uh, we can find those in California. So I'll start by talking about feeding and we'll start just by talking about bills. If you say the word finch, most of us think of a bill, a conical kind of a bill. Um, and um, that is a characteristic of finches. One of the things that is not as easy to see um, is if you, here's, a, here's from Ian Newton's, I'll have a number of pictures from Ian Newton's classic book, Finches. <clears throat> um, the inside of the bill, this is, a, this is an image that's sort of like a section through the bill taken this way. Um, and uh, the bills of finches have these husking grooves in the upper bill. Um, and these husking grooves can serve to anchor and hold uh, seeds like this little one that's shown here. And then the lower bill can push up against that and the tongue kind of wedges the, uh, the seed into this husking groove. And then the bird can remove very deftly the, um, the, 
the seed coat, the hull of the seed. And you'll, you've probably watched birds at your feeders doing this. They're really, really fast at this when they're handling um, seeds of an appropriate size and shape for them. The husking grooves actually are tapered so they can handle a variety of different sizes and shapes of seeds, but they're each, each different bill type of different finches is best for a range of particular sizes. Um, and here's a, just a picture of a female evening grosbeak who's actually discarding the fruit of a sarvis berry and eating the seed. Um, one of the most spectacular, of course, finch beaks is the crossbill, and uh, they've got these pointed bill tips. The upper bill, the so-called maxilla, is actually, it's curved, but it's curved in a, in a straight plane down in front of the bird. It's straight in front of the bird. Um, the lower bill, the mandible, curves either to the left or to the right, the right or the left. And um, the birds use these, the pointed tips, they bite between the scales of uh, conifer cones. And then they use the crossed uh, bill to, uh, in, in, um, uh, in concert with their extremely movable lower jaw. They have huge jaw uh, lateral movement capability, even for a finch, because finches can all do that a little bit. They can move the lower jaw back and forth but crossbills can move it a long way. And um, that um, helps them to open up conifer cones. So here's a picture from one of Craig Benkman's papers that just shows the crossbill puts its beak, it bites in between the scales and the basal scale. So the cone down here at the bottom, this is where it would be attached to the, to the tree. This is the tip of the cone. The basal scale is where the bird always puts its um, top bill, uh, the maxilla. And then the more distal scale is where it puts the tip of the, uh, the crossed lower, the mandible, and then it moves the jaw laterally like that and uh, turns its head and with the result that it pries up the scale and then it can get access to the seed. If the seed's loose, it can get it with its tongue and pull it back out. If it's not, it'll reach all the way down in there and hook it out with the beak. And here's a little video courtesy of Craig Bankman that you can watch. And you can just see this process going on as this bird opens a lodgepole pine cone. So it looks like it's moving the upper bill, but it's actually the lower bill that's moving re relative to the rest of the head. The upper bill is in a fixed position relative to the, to the skull and the eyes. There comes the tongue. It's trying to get that seed out of there, but this is a green cone that it can't get the, um, get the seed loose. There comes the tongue again. It's trying to dislodge it, but it's stuck in there. Now he's going to hook it out and now watch him hull it. There go those seed hulls. And we'll just go on now. Um, and um, crossbills are unusual among birds in general in that they're able to open cones that are not mature yet. Cones tend to mature in the summer. Um, and uh, so July and August, they're developing. And by September, most cones are mature at least. They don't always begin to open then, but here's an example of some Western hemlock cones, just for reference for size, they're tiny. They're like the size of the last little bit of my little finger. They're really little cones. And the little tiny type three red crossbills, we'll talk more about the types later, are really good at handling those. These are um, right here. This thing has done this to me again. It has automatically stopped showing me the, um, the little cursor. So these are, paper thin scales. These are cones. Um, this would be in probably late June, early July um, that were on a hemlock tree. They're just developing. Here's some cones from the same tree that little type three red cross pills had plucked off the tree and um, opened with their bills and extracted the seeds and then dropped to the ground. So this, these cones are the exact same age. Um, these ones just were opened a few days earlier and dropped to the ground and have started to dry out. That's why they're this color. Um, but you can see the crossbills just tear them open and get the seeds out of them. With big heavy cones like these fist-sized uh, ponderosa pine cones in Washington, um, the, uh, the cones in August, this photograph was taken in August, look like this. They're not mature yet, but they do have lots of big seeds in them. Here's what those cones from that same tree uh, collected on the same day look like if crossbills have uh, foraged on them. They pry these things open 
and extract the big seeds from them. And this was type twos, big, big, these big type twos, uh, big bruisers compared to the little type threes. Um, so they're able to open these things and extract the seeds from them, unlike most birds or most, most other things. Douglas squirrels and red squirrels can get the cones open, but um, um, most other animals are not very good at this. So you might be wondering, well, can, they, can all crossbills open all cones? And the answer is no. There's these different crossbill types that we'll talk about later, and they're morphologically suited to different kinds of cones. And I'll come back to this uh, a little bit later. So I'm going to say a little bit now about another aspect besides bills. I'm going to talk about crops and what are called gular sacs. Another name for these are sublingual pouches. Um, and these are really interesting. Um, here's a fringaline finch, a brambling male that's bringing a bunch of, of insects to his mate and babies at his nest. And he, this is all he can carry because he doesn't have one of these pouches or crops. Um, that's adapted to build to you know to carry a lot of food. So he makes lots of trips frequently from not very far away. He has to have his food access really close by because of this. In contrast, this evening grosbeak female is regurgitating whatever she has in her crop to this fledgling right here. She can carry a lot of stuff in her crop, and consequently, she can forage a long way from the nest and doesn't have to. Um, go to the nest nearly as frequently because she can bring big food deliveries uh, very um, intermittently. And here's an example, another example. This is from Ian Newton's book, Finches Again. Here's a male crossbill that's regurgitating pine seed pulp to his mate who is sitting on the nest. This is another feature of, of a lot of these cardioline finches um, is that the female will just stay on the nest most of the time and the male actually feeds her and then if the babies have hatched, she'll feed the babies when they're small. And then eventually when the babies get big enough, both members of the pair will go off and forage and then come back and feed the babies together. But he can carry enough stuff that he only has to come back and visit once or twice an hour instead of, you know, every few minutes. So this is a picture, my, the hands here, are my former student, Jamie Cornelius, and she's gently holding, it may look uncomfortable to the bird, but this is this bird is completely unharmed here. This is a crossbill in her hand. I know it's kind of hard to tell what you're looking at. The tail is right there. The head is right up there. And she has gently kind of extended the neck so that you they have very flexible necks so that you can she can spread the feathers aside on the side of the neck. So this is over here on the right hand side of the neck. And you can see all these ponderosa pine seeds in the crop of that crossbill. The, the skin of these birds is really, really thin. And um, I'm not sure if you know this, but birds are not actually covered with feathers. They have feather tracts. So there's a feather tract on the back and on the, on the breast and flank. And this area on the side of the bird doesn't have any feathers. And so she's just moved the feather tracts aside so that she can see what's in the crop. And here's a close up of that. You can see these big giant whole ponderosa pine seeds in this type two red crossbill females crop. Um, so they can carry a lot of those things. That's not even nearly full. That could bulge up a lot more than that. Um, and they can feed their babies um, just intermittently that way. And they can collect food from far away from the nest as a result. So some of the other cardiolines don't have big crops. What they have are these sublingual pouches. And this is a picture uh, from an old paper by Alden Miller um, that shows it for a rosy finch. It's this thing underneath the, the mouth, basically. Um, you, the, I would say the thing you've probably, you, you have some chance of having seen that has something kind of like this is a Clark's nutcracker. If you've ever seen them collecting seeds late in the summer to cash, like white bark pine or something, limber pine, you'll see this big bulge underneath the um, back of the lower beak. And that's their sublingual pouch that's all full of seeds. Here's a rosy finch, female, up near Tioga Pass. Um, and these birds live in places like this, where they might nest up in these, in these cirques and cliffs and rock falls. Um, and then they carry food a long way to get to where their nest is. We were netting them along the edge of this snowfield here. You can't really see it very well. There's a line right there and there's a little green misnet pole and another pole right over here. 
uh, and we were just trying to catch them as they moved through this area. Um, um, and actually, Rosie Finches, there's this really interesting uh, story that's emerged about them. Um, this is from a paper by a grad student at UC Davis named Pete Epanchin, and he found that fishless lake basins like this one in the High Sierra have lots more rosy finches than the lake basins that have had trout introduced to them. And uh, the reason, th th so the rosy finches are, you know, nesting up in places like this, fly long distances down and gather insects from around these lakes and then carry them back in their sublingual pouches, their gular sacs, to, uh, to the nests back up here. That's what makes them able to do that. What Pete has suggested is going on is that in the fishless lake basins, things like mayflies and caddisflies emerge in huge numbers because there's nothing in the lake eating them. Um, and so the rosy finches have these huge populations of or huge food supplies from these emerging um, emerging insect larvae, um, not larvae, adults. The, the larvae are in the lake and the adults come out into the terrestrial environment. Whereas in fish containing lake basins, the trout suppress the mayfly nymph and caddisfly nymph uh, larvae, sorry, uh, population so much that there's very few emerging and the rosy finches don't do as well. Here's just um, a couple pictures from Ian Newton's book. This is a pine gross beak with a bunch of stuff in its uh, sublingual pouch. It's, it's a gular sac and it's gonna feed its babies. And here's some bullfinches. These are a Eurasian bird. Um, and you can really see that the pouch is full of stuff and the birds regurgitating to those babies. So I'm going to change uh, gears here and talk about annual schedules for a little bit. Um, this is something that is very near and dear to my heart. It's what I worked on as a graduate student, and I still work on this. And we'll start by talking about breeding, but I'll also talk about molt and movement schedules. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about cardioline finches is that they have among the most flexible of songbird breeding schedules, especially when you consider the temperate zone birds that live in highly seasonal environments. And birds like red crossbills, this is a big type two crossbill. I know it doesn't look too big in the hand there, but um, here's a white wing crossbill, pine siskin. This is another super flexible species. They're almost like a little crossbill. They're just not, not quite as specialized, uh, super cool beak on the pine siskin. Uh, and red poles are all really interesting because they're capable of nesting um, in ex both both the both cold wintry conditions and um, and warm summer conditions. So this picture here was taken at one of my field sites east of Mount Rainier in uh, the Cascade Mountains. Uh, and there were crossbills type twos breeding in this ponderosa forest in this huge cone crop year um, in August and September when this picture was taken, probably August. Uh, and then they were breeding again at the same location in, uh, in the following January and February um, when it looked like this. Days are short and it's cold. And I say breeding again because actually there was a hiatus in breeding in between those two times, even though they were eating seeds from the same cone crop at both times. Um, and I'm going to emphasize this just because the dogma about crossbills has been that they can nest any time of year. And the prediction that I was expecting to have upheld um, from what I'd read in the literature was that they would breed continuously right from the summer through the winter, um, right straight across the fall. They didn't do that. And I'll come back to that in, uh, in, a, in a minute here. Um, but I just want to start by talking about this capability that a lot of these birds have to breed when it's really cold and snowy. This is a terrible looking image, but it's from an old um, paper from the 1950s that I have a bad photocopy of called the Red Crossbills of Colorado, 1953. And it's um, got an X here on this little conifer that is uh, totally covered with snow. It, there was this big snowfall in April of wet snow. That's where a crossbill nest was that they'd been monitoring. And the researchers um, looked in underneath all that snow and found the nest was just fine. The female was sitting in there in her nest um, with her uh, incubating those eggs or babies. There's snow all around it. Um, and her mate would just come in and he would go in underneath the snow um, that was covering up over the top of the nest and feed her in there and then leave. And these babies hatched and did fine. 
Here's a red poll doing the same thing. Um, and, and by the way, crossbills can do this as early as January. Um, and we found nesting birds in January and February in Wyoming. Um, here's a red poll. This is more like in June up in the Arctic, but it's going to show you just what kind of conditions they're completely tolerant of. She's sitting in her nest here in a little birch tree up uh, in the above the Arctic Circle in Alaska. The nest is really nicely lined with a bunch of ptarmigan feathers. And then here's what happened a couple days later when this snowfall came in. It's very hard to see her in here. It was kind of dark, um, but there's her eyes. Her beak is right there. There's a little black chin area. Her red crown is there and uh, the her tail goes out that way. She's sitting in there on her nest all snug in there with all this snow around her uh, and her mate just would come in and feed her. So this ability to make a nest like that um, and insulate the eggs really well, the female stays on the nest and the males feed her. This allows these birds to breed successfully in pretty um, crazily adverse conditions. Um, and um, what I wanna talk about next though, has to do with this temporal flexibility specifically of crossbills, because as I mentioned before, the dogma that I was dealing with when I first started as a graduate student and it got me interested in them in the first place was that they were supposedly would start breeding when they found a cone crop developing in the summer. That's when cones develop and then just breed straight through uh, the fall and into the winter and even into the next spring. And so when I went out uh, I was trying to find out, are they actually even physically capable of doing that? Are they staying in reproductive condition all that time? So I was looking for places where there was a huge cone crop, and um, I was specifically wanting to see if they kept their reproductive systems fully active throughout that entire time when there was a big cone crop. Other kinds of temperate zone birds show these dramatic annual cycles where, for example, the white crown sparrows that we also study up at Tioga Pass, in August, the gonads just collapse down to a completely immature state. The birds molt, they get ready for migration, they go to Mexico, and they have completely inactive reproductive systems for months. And then they regrow the gonads each spring. It's like an annual puberty. So I wanted to see what was happening with crossbills, but I didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't want to just look for nests. I wanted to know whether they were actually physically capable of breeding. So I wanted to assess their reproductive condition, but I did not want to do what old ornithologists did and go out with a gun and just shoot a bunch of them uh, so that I could look at their gonads. So I collected blood for from the wing vein for reproductive hormones. And I learned how to do a little surgery called a laparotomy where I can anesthetize the birds and make a small incision in the flank and visualize the, the gonad and estimate its uh, reproductive status. So what I'm gonna show you next is just a figure that plots the testis sizes. Oh, and then you, then you just let the bird recover and let it go. And they do great when you do this. Um, and uh, so the, um, the figure I'm gonna show you here is from two different years where there were huge ponderosa pine cone crops with large populations of type twos, these large uh, red crossbills that settled in the summer to breed and stayed there basically for the entire year. So some of the data shown here, each dot is a different individual bird that was laparotomized. And um, um, uh, some of the data come from the Eastern Cascades in Washington, and some of them come from the Warner Mountains in uh, Southern Oregon. Um, but both places, big ponderosa pine cone crops. And what, uh, what I discovered was that uh, the birds arrived and started breeding in the summer, and they had big testes then. Oh, by the way, other people had shown by doing histology on testes of crossbills that testes four millimeters in length or above were basically reproductive. Um, and below that, they were non-reproductive. And the upshot of this is they were in breeding condition in the summer. They all collapsed their gonads in the fall, um, usually by the end of September, beginning of October, and stayed in non-reproductive condition, uh, certainly through November and probably into December. But then by January, which is when a lot of these laparotomies were performed, they were in full breeding condition again, and we were finding active nests again. Um, so there was this autumn, what we call an autumn hiatus in reproduction, 
even though there were enough seeds to support breeding in the summer and again in the following winter when the days were even shorter and colder. So this was not expected, but it turns out to be pretty universal in crossbills. Um, and in fact, we've looked at this in, in three other types, type three, the littlest ones, type four, some of the medium sized ones, and type five, another big one that is common in the Rocky Mountains. And they all show this, even in big cone years, they collapse the gonads in the fall. So this is pretty interesting. It's still tremendously flexible. They're starting in January and they're breeding until the end of September. That's pretty extraordinary, but it is not nearly what was predicted based on what everybody had reported in the literature, which just turns out to be wishful thinking. It was not well-documented um, and, and um, it just isn't the case. Um, so one question is, what are they doing? Why aren't they continuing to breed if there's enough seeds to support nesting then? And the answer is they're actually molting. So here's a crossbill in Wyoming. And you can see he's got, these birds have nine primary flight feathers on the hand section of the wing. One, two, three, four, five is hidden. It's behind this feather here, it's growing. These two are actually growing also. And then six, seven, eight, and nine, these are old feathers. So this guy's sort of in the middle of molt right now. Um, and just here's some feathers that are growing, just so you can see that primary is one, two, and three. This is starting at the wrist of the bird and extending out. And you can see also that it's proceeding in this very systematic orderly fashion from starting with the first primary, which grows first, and then these others follow. Uh, the other thing that they need to do is replace the body plumage. Here's one, this one's also in Wyoming, um, where he looks like he's just multicolored. Um, this little guy is also just, if you blow these feathers aside, here's what you see. There's a bunch of bright red feathers coming through his multicolored older yellow plumage. These are pin feathers right here and here and here, and then sheathed red feathers right there. So this guy is in the process of replacing his body plumage. Um, when these birds molt, um, they get about halfway through the primary molt up to maybe the fifth primary, and then they start to engage the tail and the all this body plumage. And the last half of molt is an incredibly demanding energetically and nutritionally uh, process. And that's what they're doing in October, um, in September and October. And so this leads to this very uh, slow in onset of molt in July, and then it accelerates in September and October, and they're finished roughly by November, at least in the North American populations that we've looked at. So this is what's happening when the birds collapse the gonads and go into this non-breeding hiatus. Uh, and this is essential if they're going to survive. They need good new flight surfaces because feathers just wear out after they're produced. They only molt once a year. They make these in, in this time of year, and those feathers are supposed to last them until the next fall. Um, so, and their insulation is critical. By the end of the summer, their plumage looks pretty bad from the, from the previous year. And they make this brand new, fresh, really good, well-insulated plumage. So that they're ready to go into the winter with good flight surfaces, good plumage uh, for insulation. And they wait to resume breeding until they're finished with that and see if there's enough seeds to, to support it. And if there are, then they resume. So the other thing that's really interesting here, not just in crossbills, but in um, siskins and a number of other ones of these cardioline finches is their movement patterns. And uh, they have a couple of things that they do. Um, they, um, there's two kinds of movements that they do basically. They're, they're nomads, so they move around. They don't have a regular seasonal back and forth migration like a lot of temperate zone birds. And in addition to that, they are eruptive. And those two things, you may have heard these terms before, but they're not the same thing. Eruptions are when birds, whole populations, just, just evacuate their normal place, their normal range, and fly to some place that can be hundreds to even thousands of kilometers away uh, and spend a few months there and then eventually return, if they survive, return to their normal range. They're usually, these eruptions are escaping usually bad conditions. Nomadic movements turn out to be regular seasonal phenomena that they do just as part of their normal annual cycle where they're trying to find their next good cone crop or whatever seed supply. 
So here's some data from also Newton's Finch's book, and it shows evidence of the kind of nomadic behavior that crossbills show. So on the top right here is just the spruce cone crop in different years. These are different years across the x-axis. And in some years, there's tons of cones. And in some years, there's very few at this location. This is one of the things that people have always emphasized about what crossbills are having to deal with is this spatial um, erraticness of their seed supply. So this is fluctuating. And the numbers of crossbills that accumulate in these different areas, or in this area, this one area where this research was done, is very consistent. In years when there's a lot of cones, there's a lot of crossbills. And when there's no cones, there's very few crossbills. This is because the birds move into those areas in the good years and leave in the bad years. This is their nomadic behavior. And this nomadic behavior is happening, it turns out, in spring. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. In contrast, um, eruptions, here's also from Newton's book. So there's eruptions are a totally different story. So they are, this is a banding station in the Swiss Alps that in one particular year, um, had this enormous invasion of crossbills um, that people suspected came from Northeastern Europe and Russia based on the size of the birds and other stuff. And this is where the birds were banded. And then these, these open circles are recaptures of birds banded here within that same year, just within a few months of, the, of them being banded here. But then if you go into the next year or later, so longer, longer after, what they find is that the birds that were recovered were way the heck back up here, thousands of kilometers away in northeastern Europe and Russia, which is where they had suspected the birds that had shown up here on this eruptive movement had uh, come from. So the birds left here for some reason, piled into central Europe, spent the winter and some of the spring there, and then bailed out and headed back up this up here and showed up here at some point months later. This is what an eruption is. And we have these that happen in North America. For example, the little type three red crossbills that are common on the Pacific Northwest coast up through Southeast Alaska, periodically will pour across the country and show up in New England and spend a few months there, sometimes even breed, and then just vanish and go back to the Pacific Northwest. Um, this is a fairly regular phenomenon, but it doesn't happen every year like the nomadic movements do. So this nomadism is turns out to be just this fundamental part of the birds, uh, of their behavior and their annual schedule. And it's common in crossbills. It's common in um, pine siskins. It's common in some of the other kinds of birds, uh, gross beaks and, and the finches like uh, Cassin's finches show a certain amount of winter nomadism wandering around. But um, what's really interesting is that this nomadic migration has elements of it um, that are um, kind of like, just, just discovered I had left a, a stove burner on and I just happened to notice it. Um, the, um, let me get my train of thought back. Um, Right. So these things, um, they move in the spring. And this has been observed by a bunch of people. Newton talks about it in his book. Um, but this is happening at the worst possible time of year for them to find seeds. And this is because conifer cone crops on most of the conifers that crossbills use are going to be finishing shedding their seeds. And the cones are even beginning to drop from the trees Crossbills typically eat most of their seeds from the cones on the trees. So the cones are shedding their seeds during the winter and spring. The crossbills can breed using those, but then by, the, by mid spring, the seed supply is reaching an annual minimum. And um, they then need to somehow get from where they are to the next place. And they don't have any way of anticipating how far they're gonna have to go. Most birds put on a big bunch of fat and migrate a particular distance. Well, so what do crossbills do? Well, one thing that they do do is they fatten for nomadic spring migration. This is a figure from a, a paper that, one, that Jamie Cornelius wrote. And this shaded area just shows in May and June, the subcutaneous fat scores are, the combined fat score is, is close to four, which is 
is high for crossbills and it's actually higher than their winter fat back here. And people who study migration typically use evidence, they, they consider it evidence of, of migratory fattening if the fat load in the spring is higher than the winter fat load, which they have just sort of as an insurance policy to get through long cold nights. So they fatten, but they still don't have a huge fat score. A white crown sparrow would be way the heck up here. And um, they're also, the question is, how are they fattening when they don't have very many seeds? And can they re-fatten along the way when they're, not, when they're moving through habitat that doesn't even have any, um, any seeds available? So how do they fuel this seasonal spring migration when conifer seed supplies are at an annual minimum? So this is something we've gotten really interested in recently, and we've pulled together some data from old um, captures that we've done. And this, this is what I've got here right now. Remember I said, and I showed you those pictures of the crops of the crossbill, and you could see all those big ponderosa pine seeds. Well, you can also see on some of them, there's a bunch of other stuff in there that's clearly not seeds. It's often dark, can be green or black or brown, and it's clearly not seeds. And um, based on the fact that I've observed crossbills eating insects a lot in May and June, this is what um, made me suspicious that actually what they're probably doing is using insects. So in June is when the highest proportion of crops that we scored in the hand had what we'll just call non-seed um, uh, contents, non-seed co crop contents. So that's suspicious right there that maybe they're eating a lot of seed, a lot, a lot of non-seeds, insects. And uh, it turns out we have a lot of observations now of them eating other stuff. This is a, an elm leaf that um, was dropped from an elm tree right outside the uh, library at the University of Washington one day in the near the end of May. I walked into I was walking into the library and there was this swarm of crossbills in the elm tree above me making a big lot of noise and all these leaves were falling down. And what they were doing was scissoring open these rolled leaves that the woolly aphid colonies had formed and licking the, the aphids out of these things and dropping the leaves. Um, they also, I've seen lots of crossbills in Washington foraging on these, these little white, waxy, fuzzy things here. These are coolie gall aphids. Um, and the crossbills lick those things off the of Douglas fir emergent growth. Um, bud worms, like on this silver fir, they eat lots of those. And then most recently up by Mount Shasta in June a few years ago, I found a bunch of crossbills in cottonwoods eating pediole gall aphids. These are, um, these, are these aphids that um, create these galls, these funny little hard galls at the base of, this, of the leaf. And the crossbill beak actually turns out to be really good for prying these things open, and then they lick the aphids out of those. So this is something that we're following up on a lot right now is to try to understand more how insects are, uh, what role they're playing in the ability of these birds to actually even be nomadic and exploit these unpredictable uh, seed resources that they're morphologically um, specialized to use. And um, yeah, actually, I think I'll just skip that because I'm running a little short on time. So basically, cr crossbills and other cardioline finches have really interesting annual schedules. And um, it's one of the things that I've been really interested in for a long time. So I'm going to really switch gears now and talk a little bit about vocal behavior. And I'll talk specifically about call matching and learning. And calls is the really important thing here because most of you probably know that a lot of songbirds learn aspects of their vocal behavior, but it, that's mostly got to do with song. When I first learned about this, people just told me song is learned and calls are innate. They just don't, that's, they're genetically determined. Um, work by Paul Mundinger on American goldfinches showed this was not completely true. So American goldfinches have these pair specific calls um, that are, it makes it highly likely that they would, uh, that the pairs must have converged in their call characteristics. And these are some little spectrograms. It's, it's time along the x-axis here and frequency on the y-axis. And each of these columns here is a different pair. So here's the call of the male of this pair, and here's the call of the female. They look almost identical. Here's 
those same things for a different pair. And here's yet another pair. And here's yet another pair. And you can see the extreme similarity of these things. Cass and Finches also do this. Fred Sampson shown it, showed it. Here's male and female of one pair of this little pair-specific key-up call that they have. And just look how similar the spectrogram looks for the, this pair and this pair and this pair and this pair. And he even did another little experiment where he tried playing the male calls at the female when she was on the nest. And if he played her mate's call, she would come off the nest and call, and call back like she expected to be fed. But if he played the calls of a different male at her when she was on the nest, she didn't do anything. Um, and Mundinger showed the same thing actually with uh, goldfinches. If they hear their mate coming, they call and beg. And if they hear other males around, they don't. So it turns out in crossbills, Jeff Groth also showed the same things, pair specific calls in crossbills a number of years later. Um, but one of the things that hadn't been looked at carefully was the actual process of changing the calls. Um, that was just circumstantial. It's like the pairs have really similar calls. Is that because they are um, they just mated with a bird that sounds really like them, or did they actually converge in the calls? Was there learning involved? Um, and uh, Jeff did some little preliminary things on this and showed that some babies could learn the calls of their foster parents. Um, my um, uh, graduate student, Kendra Sewell, did a project where she showed that adult red crossbills, she did a pretty complete experiment showing that adult red crossbills will call match when they pair. So they start off different a little bit, but then they converge as they pair, um, but they can only do it if they're the same call type. So uh, we've talked, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about call types in just a minute. Um, she also showed that babies can learn the calls of their foster parents, and it doesn't matter what the whether the foster parents are the same call type or another call type. So here's a juvenile that the call that it that it developed, and it matches the foster parents, which were both this rising call type, uh, like type four. Here's the biological parents. Here's the foster parents. The juvenile looks just like the foster parents, but it's a similar sort of call. It's this rising call. Whereas this, and then this experimental juvenile was one that was cross fostered to a different call type. These are type three parents. These are type four foster parents. It matches the type fours. So the babies are much more flexible than the adults. But all of this is showing that these calls can be learned. And in only a few of the cardiolines has this been studied carefully. Some of the goldfinches, siskins do it, and, um, and crossbills. Things like evening grosbeaks haven't been studied yet. So I want to say a little bit more about vocal behavior here. Another really cool thing is this heterospecific vocal imitation. Hetero means other, so other species vocal imitation. And I cottoned on to this when I was studying uh, crossbills in eastern the eastern Cascades in Washington, and I discovered that Cassin's finches were producing a lot of type four red crossbill calls as parts of their songs. So here's, um, here's a few different examples of type four red crossbill calls in this guy's song, um, this particular song. Um, and it turns out Cassin's finches do this a ton. Hopefully you'll be able to hear this. I'm gonna play this. Um, this is the full song of a, of a Cassin's finch. Um, it's a long, jumbled, complicated, wonderful song that many of you have probably heard. So that's the whole thing. Um, just, I'm gonna pull a few pieces out of it here and you can see if you can, if you can identify any of them. Here's a little bit of something right here. Um, see, if, see if this sounds like anything to you. I'm just playing it a few times there. That's a pine grosbeak right there, call. Here's another thing. That's a Townsend solitaire. These are great imitations. I actually sent some of these recordings of imitations of pine grosbeaks 
in Cassim's Finch song to a guy who studies pine grosbeaks. I just pulled them out and sent them to him and said, what do you, what do you think this is? And he just said, it's a pine grosbeak. And he even said what part of the country it was from. So they're really good imitations. Here's another thing. That's a robin. That's one of the notes that robins make, American robins. And here's one more thing. And that's a type one evening grosbeak. Um, interestingly, this was recorded in Wyoming. Type one evening grosbeaks are usually the main call type of evening grosbeaks that's up there. And I'll talk a little bit about those in just a minute. Cassin's finches do this, purple finches do this. Um, um, house finches do not, those three are close relatives, but house finches don't, purple and cassins both do. Some of the gold finches are also really good at this. Here's a lesser goldfinch song. I'm gonna play that one more time. So deconstructing that one a little bit, here's this first thing here. So that's a different evening grosbeak. That's a type two evening grosbeak. Interestingly, this guy was recorded in Sierra County, California, and there's lots of type two evening grosbeaks there. And actually there's another repetition of that right there. Here's another call from evening grosbeaks. It's a trill call. So this guy's up, he's copied both of those. And um, here's another thing. Hopefully some of you will recognize that. It's not a songbird. It is a bird, though. That's a kill deer right there. That's a peak call of a hairy woodpecker. And that's part of the vocal repertoire of a Western wood peewee. These guys are really good imitators. We still don't know why they do this, why it's evolved for this. There's a number of hypotheses, but none of them have been really tested. So um, I'm not going to say anything more about that, but it probably is a sexually selected trait that's involved either in male-male competition or attracting mates. Um, but they're really good at copying things and just beware if you're out in the woods and you hear something that you think is one thing, it could be one of our really good vocal imitator finches. Um, they're really, really good at imitating sounds. So I'm gonna finish off really quickly by talking about cryptic taxa. Uh, I mentioned this before, there are all these different, there turns out to be 12 different vocal types of red crossbills. It's been reduced to 11 now because one of them, type nine, was split off as its own species, the Cassia crossbill from Southern Idaho. Um, Craig Bankman discovered those. Um, these crossbill vocal types were discovered by Jeff Groth um, and he published this back in the early 1990s. Um, here's the vocal types of five of them, types one, two, three, four, five. The one that you're most likely to encounter in the Sierra Nevada is type two. It's a dropping, kind of a chup, chup, uh, sort of a flight call. Um, with practice, humans can tell these apart. And these different ones, they vary in body size and their bill morphologies, and they appear to be adapted to and associate with different uh, suites of conifers. So it's really interesting. Evening grosbeaks also have these flight call types, and I'm sort of running out of time here, but I'll just play a couple of them for you. That's type one. That's the Northwestern one. I just heard some here in Truckee this morning, though, actually. That's type two. Um, and that's the common Sierra bird. Um, and uh, these things we discovered a number of years ago and, and published a little paper about this. And now people have been um, posting a lot of recordings of these with their eBird recordings. Um, I'll skip that slide. The geographic ranges of these birds, type two, as far as we can tell, we're still trying to work this out. And this is one of the places that you as um, bird watchers can help uh, by making recordings is where are these birds and at what times of year? Um, type twos typically are in the Sierra Nevada and Southern Cascades. Type ones are in the um, more all through the Northwest. Um, type fours are the Rocky Mountain birds. Type fives are Mexican evening grosbeaks. Type threes are in the East. <clears throat> and um, uh, there, this is one of these emerging stories right now. Um, I had both type twos and ones here in Truckee this morning. 
So basically, I just want to leave you with the idea that finches are amazing. This is a purple finch. They also have flight call types. There's at least two um, sort of the eastern nominant uh, subspecies and the Californica subspecies have, have quite different flight calls. So that's another thing. Record purple finch calls and post them with your um, with your um, eBird postings. Um, and they're just also even, you know, the, the beaks, here's baby crossbills. I just love this picture. Um, these are baby crossbills with their little conical beaks um, that gradually develop into those uh, crossed beaks. These little guys are just waiting for their parents to come feed them. Um, you can do a lot to actually improve our knowledge about finches by your observations of what are crossbills eating that you encounter at different times of year um, and wherever they are, even if you don't know what type they are. Um, if you keep record, if you keep notes about those kinds of things uh, and post them with your eBird postings, those things are going to become part of a permanent data set. And the same with audio audio recordings that you may make. And I'm almost done. I've gone over a little bit. I'm sorry about that. Um, I just want to make you aware of this Finch Research Network. Uh, if you just Google it, Finch Research Network, it's going to come up and you can find out a lot of ways that you can actually help contribute to knowledge about finches. This guy, Matt Young, is the founder of it. And he's just a crazed, fanatical finch guy. And he's one of the ones who's really bringing clarity about where all the different crossbill types are located and one of the reasons he's able to do that is because bird watchers have been posting lots of recordings from crossbills all over the continent and um, it's just really fascinating so you can go to this finch research network site i especially encourage you to make sound recordings and just behavioral observations about what birds are eating um, and i'll just end there um, this is my former student, Jamie, who's another crossbill fanatic. She's on the faculty at Oregon State University. This is honestly one of our, one of the most ugly places to do field work in one of the most beautiful places in the world. It's Grand Teton. There's Mount Moran in the back, background, but it's this smoky day at the sewage lagoons near Signal Mountain. It's a great place to catch finches for some reason. And so we've done a lot of work there. Um, and uh, I'll just leave that, leave you with that. And if there's time, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Tom. It was a really interesting presentation. And um, would like now to uh, ask people to type any questions they may have into the chat box. Uh, we have one there already from uh, Larry Parmeter. Okay. Um, and his question is, hang on a second, let me just, Larry's question uh, is, especially with crossbills, does the tree sap that, you know, from the cones affect their eating habits and patterns? Okay, that's a great question. I don't know if you noticed on one of the pictures I showed of a little female bird, there was a bunch of gunk on the lower beak on the mandible. And when they're eating, um, especially green cone, I was calling green as immature cones, they get a lot of pitch on them and they have to spend a lot of time cleaning that off. Um, and in fact, especially with some of the birds, like the big type twos, they're handling these big cones. They have to stick their face way down in there and they get pitch on it and it actually tears out some of the feathers. I've caught uh, crossbills with one whole side of their face bare at the end of the summer because the feathers have just been being pulled out all summer. They can look really terrible by the end of the summer when they've been handling the cone. The, 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 the feathers are old and they've been handling pitchy cones all summer. So um, I think the answer is probably the pitch does make a big difference. Nobody has actually studied it, but I would not be surprised if trees that have pitchier cones are less attractive to the crossbill. So individual trees, mm -hmm. they make when when you when they're foraging on different trees, there's often particular trees that they're foraging from preferentially. And um, you can tell this because you'll find cones all over the ground or you'll see torn up cones on the tree. And it wouldn't surprise me if how pitchy those cones are is affecting which trees the birds prefer to use. So it's a great question. Thank you for that. Interesting. Thank you. 
Uh, Linda Schaffhauser says, amazing information. Thank you for the detailed research. And uh, and I had a question for you about the recordings. I noticed that in the picture you had someone with a parabolic mic and everything. So do you need special equipment to do these recordings? So that's a really good question, too. Um, there is so I just use um, my iPhone and there's an app on it called um, Voice Record Pro right there. Mm -hmm. And you can, with that thing, just a second, close that. Um, with that thing, when you set it up to record, um, it's set to record there. Now you can set, you can do a bunch of settings on that, including what file type. So it can make it as an MP3 or something, but it can also record these uncompressed wave files um, that are much better. And you can select the sampling rate. And if this stuff doesn't mean anything to you, you can go to the Cornell mm. um, website and it has, they have a bunch of suggestions for what settings to use. And you don't get great recordings if you don't have some kind of um, assistance like a parabolic reflector, but um, you can get absolutely um, identifiable recordings. Like if you just take this out and hold it up and point it at flying by evening gross speaks or crossbills, and you get some calls on there, somebody who's good at um, identifying them by ear will be able to tell what they are. And a lot of times they'll be good enough that you can make spectrograms from them. The other thing, I don't have it here right now, but if you can get, I, I make recordings, I stick this thing in a parabolic reflector hmm. and uh, the microphone that it's using is right there. And if I just set it up so that the mic is pointing into the parabola and is positioned where it's supposed to be, you can get pretty great recordings of birds that way. They're probably not going to hold up for, you know, the most technical analysis things, but you get a really good signal. So um, if you can find a parabola and figure out a way to attach your phone in it appropriately, you can actually get even better recordings. Very so nice. I, I would encourage people to just use their phones and tons of the stuff that's posted on eBird, the recordings are just made with people's phones with that um, voice record pro and um, which is a free app, as long as you're willing to tolerate some ads and, um, and they're good enough. The recordings are good enough that they'll allow people to identify, for example, cross bill or evening gross beak types on there. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, one yeah. question from Greg Estep. Where around here is a good place to find crossbills? I've seen red crossbills around Tuolumne Meadows, but that's about it. Tuolumne is a great place. Uh, so in the in the Sierra Nevada, I would say find places with lodgepole pine, and you'll find at least small numbers of type two red crossbills, one of the big forms. Usually, that doesn't mean you'll find them every time you go there. Um, some like we do a lot of work around Tioga Pass on white crown sparrows, and there's tons of lodgepole pine there, and there's not always tight, there's not always crossbills there, but there there often are places that I've been that almost always have at least a few. Um, up around north of Truckee, I know that's not super close to you, but um, just on the east side here, up around Truckee. Um, there's like the Donner Pass or Donner Party picnic area or a trail or something. There's a place there along the road up towards Sierraville that I've usually found crossbills there. And there's some dirt roads that head off in those areas that there's usually at least a handful of type twos. If there are years when there's tons of crossbills around here. Um, so a year when there's a good ponderosa pine cone crop, you can probably find type twos all over the place. One, in fact, I think maybe the first place I ever saw a crossbill was on the little road down into Sage Hen Creek, which is north of Truckee. Um, and it was just a bunch of, a bunch of crossbills eating ponderosa pine, but I would say mostly you'll find them in lodgepole. And then in years when there's a good ponderosa crop, you'll find them in some ponderosa, um, that's about the best I can do. Um, there, I would not say the Sierra is the best place to look for crossbills. If you can go um, up 
by Shasta and Lassen. There are often cross bills up there more. And when you get into Oregon and Washington, there's lots. And actually this type 10, um, a, what, and this was discovered by a bird watcher, type 10 red crossbills, a bird watcher, a guy named Kenneth Irwin, was who lived up on the North Coast. There's type 10 crossbills in Sitka spruce all the time on the North Coast of California. So if you can make a bigger trip, you're, you're pretty much guaranteed to find them there, like at Patrick's Point State Park and places like that. But like locally for you, I, I I just don't know what to say except spend a lot of hours out in Lodgepole Pine. Okay, well, thank you. I don't see any other questions. I'll wait a second and see if anything pops up. But I wanna thank you again for a fantastic presentation and very full of information. And I think it was greatly appreciated by our, our listeners today. Great, well, it was my pleasure. And if you're ever looking for any other talks, I could talk about White Crown's sparrows or I could talk just about crossbills. There's a lot of great stuff about them. So, and I could also give you names of other people. There's a bunch of great graduate students around UC Davis who do wonderful work on, on birds. And so if you're ever yeah. looking for other people, let me know and I can give you names of folks. That sounds great. I might take you up on that. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. It's a little after eight, so we're going to call it quits for the night. And thanks again, Tom. Have a good evening, okay. everyone. Thanks. And we'll thanks, see you in Robert. September. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.